I think everybody at this point has kind of heard about our, uh, our uh, automated attenuator truck or autonomous attenuator truck that we tried out uh, about a month or so ago in Colorado. Um, what kind of started us down this path was a little over a year ago, we had the first uh, beer run with a driverless truck. You know, everybody thought that was a pretty good idea to see if we could move a truck load of beer down the highway 100 miles. And uh, I, I suppose the driver actually could have been sitting in the sleeper cab enjoying one of those beers. And, but uh, that, that worked out really well. Um, I, I think that speaks to what, uh, when you have leadership of your, of your organization that's uh, not so risk averse that they won't take a chance on something new. You know, there was a lot of consternation and uh, our director, Shaylin, uh, he, he, he jokes about, you know, he could have uh, had a change in career that quick if uh, that project hadn't gone as well as it did. But that, that kind of gave our organization the confidence to go the next step. What, what's the next thing we should do? And uh, that ended up being this attenuator project so uh, we entered into this with uh, a few partners from private industry, uh, Royal Trucking. They provided the, uh, the vehicle. They had some experience with this, uh, this technology and this, this idea. They worked uh, a little bit with the state of Florida. And for reasons I'm not too clear on, uh, that didn't uh, go as far as they would have liked to have it go. Uh, they also partnered with uh, England's version of the Department of Transportation. Uh, so we kind of had a parallel effort going on between England and Colorado with uh, Royal Truck facilitating in the middle. Uh, the uh, partner that provides the technology that makes autonomous operation possible is called Kratos. And they, uh, they have a lot of background in the defense industry with uh, platooning of vehicles. And you may have seen some of those videos on, on different television programs about the, uh, the technology the military was playing with to uh, move supplies across the battlefield with autonomous technology. So that's where a lot of this came from. So CDOT decided to partner with those two agencies. Uh, uh, we, we got a truck and uh, we'll talk about how things have progressed from there. So our vision was uh, kind of simple really. What's the purpose of an attenuator truck? It's out there to, uh, to take a hit. It's kind of counterintuitive to have a, a driver in a truck that's supposed to get hit. And, uh, you know, if you look around the country, there's examples in every state of, of accidents involving attenuator trucks where people have been hurt or killed. And uh, that, that's something we wanted to see if uh, maybe there's a way we can eliminate one of those uh, injuries or accident or injuries or deaths from that equation. Efficiency of operations, uh, that, that's another bonus to this technology is you've got one less person driving your vehicle, which means you have one more person actually out there performing whatever highway maintenance task it might be. The gist of the project is uh, you have a, a lead vehicle, which in our case we elected to use a paint striping truck, and you have the follower vehicle, which is the attenuator, and uh, what we wanted to prove out was that this attenuator vehicle could follow exactly in the footsteps of, of the lead vehicle and not deviate from that path whatsoever and uh, make sure that it could do all these things safely so that it, uh, when and if we did put this out on public roadways, it's not going to become a hazard. So it does that through uh, the use of a front-mounted radar, uh, and then it's got a uh, electric over mechanical steering system in the vehicle, uh, electric over uh, electric system to uh, interact with the braking system of the, of the following vehicle, and of course the accelerator as well. Now that radar allows it to detect obstacles in its path. So if, if it's following the lead vehicle, and uh, a person or another vehicle or some other type of object comes between those two vehicles, the attenuator automatically stops and uh, avoids that collision. We went with uh, Royal Trucks. Uh, they, they provided the chassis for this project and uh, installed all their technology on it. Uh, we did uh, ask them and they, and they confirmed that it is possible to retrofit this technology on other trucks. So. You know, if you're out there uh, considering getting involved in this and getting, getting uh, on board with this autonomous vehicle, you don't necessarily have to buy a brand new truck. They, they have the capability to retrofit it to your existing trucks. Uh, that consists of uh, antenna navigation module, and we'll see a little bit more of that here, and uh, communications module. And then they have a, a very uh, simple upfit kit that goes on the lead vehicle. It doesn't take very long to install, about half a day. And that's uh, technology that can be removed from lead vehicle and swapped between lead vehicles if you have the time to do that. Okay, we had, uh, we're fortunate to have a really, really sharp intern uh, that was working with CDOT. 
a young gentleman named Joe Meyer. Uh, he was a master student at the Colorado School of Mines. A uh, very tech-savvy tech guy, and uh, we uh, kind of went out on the limb and said, hey, let's, let's give this young man an opportunity to excel. So he kind of led this project for us and uh, worked with the vendors and, uh, and made this testing happen. And uh, the evaluations that he set up were, were very thorough. Uh, he put the uh, vehicle through multiple scenarios, pretty much anything uh, he, he imagined that might go wrong in this, in this uh, autonomous environment. He created a test to uh, see how the vehicle performed in that scenario. And uh, he was able to give a lot of great feedback to the manufacturer to help them improve the product and get it more tailored to what DOTs do out on the road. So we did all these, of course, on a closed track. Uh, we were able to find an old airfield that nobody uses anymore. So it was a safe environment to do this where there's no risk of you know, causing harm to the public or, or doing catastrophic damage to anything out there. Through that uh, evaluative process and feedback to the, uh, the manufacturer, Royal Truck, we were able to uh, get that lane accuracy dialed into plus or minus four inches, which uh, we thought was pretty acceptable for what attenuators are going to be out there doing. Uh, I don't think you're ever going to achieve a perfect tracking you know, with a zero tolerance, but that's, that's about as close as I think you could hope to get. We found uh, that the uh, technology in the following vehicle performed much better than a human driver could perform. Uh, the, the reaction time to obstacles, the braking reaction time, the uh, steady acceleration and the keeping pace with the lead vehicle, uh, we have a graph here I think that'll show that, uh, was much better than a human driver could do. So this is on a 15 mile an hour run through a cone lane. Uh, the cones were spaced at about 113 inches apart so it gave the uh, vehicle about six inches from the base of the cone to either side of the attenuator truck so it didn't leave it a lot of error or a lot of room for error so you can see how uh, accurately it follows the lead vehicle through that course and then uh, you can set the interval between the lead and the follower of the vehicle you can tighten it up or stretch it out as your operations dictate and uh, here, here's a graph that kind of shows the uh, the difference between the technology it shows the difference between the, uh, the technology being in charge of the attenuator truck and uh, the human driver, the human driver being on the right. So you can see that uh, there's a lot more consistency, a lot less variation. Okay, here's uh, a run with, this is uh, one of the runs we did on the closed track. I think it was the first run where there was actually no driver sitting there just in case. We, we uh, let this thing fly on its own. But this is what it looks like from inside the attenuator truck and you can see, kind of see the steering wheel doing its thing. And, Okay, this run was also at about seven miles an hour, so we tried to replicate the, uh, the speed that most striping operations would be done at, around seven, eight miles an hour. Okay, so uh, after all this testing was complete, they did that over about a week period between a Monday and a Friday. Uh, made some adjustments and tweaks along the way. Uh, they decided, all right, let's, let's go out on that limb and uh, we'll take it up to Fort Collins at the university and we'll expose this thing to the media and the public and pretty much all comers were welcome to watch it. We did it on Facebook Live, so there was, there was a lot of risk there. I mean, the, the, you know, you're putting this thing out in front of the public and hoping it works. And, <laughs> and uh, to, to Joe and his team's credit, everything worked as advertised. So our next event happened at Greeley. Uh, it was right, done right outside the region headquarters, uh, region four headquarters in Greeley. And uh, that was uh, also not just to get uh, you know, our, uh, the media and everyone else an opportunity to see this thing again, but it was also to allow CDOT employees a chance to see what was going on and get, uh, get them to understand the direction the organization was going with this attenuator. Then we hosted as part of that event, uh, kind of a peer exchange where uh, I know Caltrans was represented there along with several other states and agencies and they were given an opportunity to ask questions and uh, of course see a live demonstration. Uh, they, they saw a very similar presentation to what I just gave you about how the testing was done uh, but we, they went much, much more in detail on that than I did today and uh, there was a lot of discussions uh, revolving around policy. Uh, Colorado had no policy, no statute, no anything that came remotely close to addressing 
how are we going to incorporate autonomous technology into our vehicle fleets? How, how is this stuff going to be allowed to function on our public roadways? How is it going to be allowed to function during our maintenance operations? No, no state had ever done that before, so there was no reason to have a statute. So uh, luckily, uh, our, our uh, liaisons that work with our legislature at CDOT, uh, they were able to uh, pretty rapidly get the group together and start thinking about these policies that would have to be created and uh, setting up a structure that tells uh, vendors in the public Colorado welcomes this technology. We, we want to participate with you, and, and here's a process we can go through to achieve those goals and do so with public safety always foremost in, in our minds. So that, that happened very quickly. I don't think anybody's ever seen legislation move that fast. So it's pretty cool to see that. Other things we discussed is, uh, you know, just batting ideas around about how, how is this going to change an operation out on the road? You know, what are the things that need to be considered? Uh, is this is this going to cause us to change how we do business? Uh, we discussed uh, project development. Where are we going to go f forward from this point? And it was also discussed uh, whether states wanted to enter into a pool fund to push this forward and, and accelerate the process to get more states on board with it and make it reality faster. Okay, we also involved our uh, state patrol. You know, they have a vested interest in this because a lot of times we send those attenuators out to, uh, to things the state patrol is concerned about. And uh, they're a pretty good partner with us when it comes to, uh, we think we have a great idea. The state patrol usually has a nice perspective on, well, did you think about this? Did you think about that in regard to public safety? Okay, so our next steps are, uh, we want to we start testing this thing out on low, low traffic volume roads. You know, actually get it out on a real maintenance mission, uh, but, but start out kind of baby steps where, where there's low risk and uh, evaluate how it does and continuously give feedback to the manufacturer and make adjustments and corrections as we see fit. And then uh, take that next step forward, you know, get it out there in a little bit more of a, a normal traffic uh, maintenance operation. And then uh, eventually get it, you know, my boss's goal is to eventually have that thing on I-25 or I-70 and have it be normal to have a truck out there that's not being actually driven by a person. Okay, uh, some of the feedback we, we gave to the manufacturer was uh, the ability to uh, more easily adjust that interval between the, the lead vehicle and the attenuator. Uh, right now you have to do that. You have to stop both vehicles, go back to the, the follower vehicle, make your adjustments on the, on the system. Uh, we'd like to see that controlled from the cab of the of the leader vehicle where you can do it on the fly with a dial control or, or some other interface that's in the lead vehicle and make that adjustment as needed so you don't have to completely shut down what you're doing to make that uh, make that change uh, we also asked for uh, some live stream video to come off of that uh, a test mode so we can check the system out a little bit quicker and better before operations to make sure everything's ready to function. Uh, pause mode, that, that, that was a feature we would like to see on it. And uh, the ability to uh, tighten up that turning radius a little bit so it can make tight U-turns. And also uh, one other one that came up, I don't think it's on here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when the vehicle encounters an obstacle, it automatically shuts everything down, stops it in place. Well, as the, as the technology exists today, someone has to get out of that lead vehicle, go back to the attenuator truck and reset everything, and that takes a couple of minutes. So we'd like to have the capability to reset that from the lead vehicle so there, you can save time and get it back into operation right away. Okay, and this is, uh, yeah, one of the guys in CDOT, uh, he's a drone operator and he, he really does, uh, he enjoys making movies, so he did this little uh, drone movie for us. So you can watch that if, while anybody uh, asks any questions you might have. So you can still so you can drive it to the work site and then get out. And, all right. Yeah, you can. Uh, everything's still fully functional in a manual mode, and uh, after you uh, get the vehicle to the job site, you configure everything, set up the computer, and. So the question was, how well does it take turns autonomously? Yeah, it it, it follows within that four-inch uh, tolerance of the lead vehicle, and uh, as long as you stay within the turning radius of the vehicle. It, it's capable of following right behind whatever the lead vehicle did. So, Chris, I know you can adjust the gap 
is it using the radar unit to adjust gap or is it basically using GPS timestamp locations to know when the lead vehicle got to a certain point therefore it knows so which the, the latter is the case it uh, the GPS puts down a, a, an electronic breadcrumb trail at the rate of I believe it's 10 locations per second so it's pretty it's, it's pinging pretty quickly so it gives it a lot of data points to follow and uh, it bases its interval off of following those data points and, and that's how it matches the speed of the lead vehicle as well through that GPS coordinate. And you've just exceeded my understanding of the technology of... <laughs> so my question is, uh, what's the, do you have an estimated cost as far as retrofit? Uh, the cost of the, this entire system you see here was about $300,000 and about half of that cost is the technology. So around one, high 140s, 150 and the truck was the rest of the cost. And that's uh, something that I, you know, talking to the manufacturer, you know, as this thing gains momentum, economy of scale will probably come into effect and it'll get cheaper as it becomes more prevalent. So is the truck yours now, is it? Yes. Colorado's? Yeah, we bought the, uh, the first truck we played with was uh, a prototype that was owned by Royal Trucking and they brought it to our location and it was kind of a proof of concept demonstration so we could see that yes this actually does have potential and then we bought one unit from them and had them configure it to our, our, uh, our needs and our desires and that's the one that you see here in the video. Yes, it will, um, but in the scenario we used it in, uh, you've got the, the operators of the striper truck that are able to see everything that's going on with the vehicle as well. But yes, they'll get a, a, an alarm if something happens to the attenuator behind them if they're, if they're in a different type of operation. Let's say uh, you're leading it with a sweeper truck and you can't necessarily see the back of the attenuator from there, it, it'll tell them. So from a maintenance point of view, um, the backup truck gives feedback to the front vehicle basically like if you're following a sweeper you would be telling them if the sweepers trailing or um, even if there's a close call you'd be like, hey heads up guys close call back here or something like that you kind of lose that with an autonomous backup truck am I not right there um, well there's some other capabilities on here that really didn't come out in this slideshow but this uh, this thing's equipped with uh, video cameras pretty much all around it it's also got a, a telescoping VMS board, very, very large VMS board, and uh, there's capabilities to outfit uh, like a, ra a rear-facing radar to let you know you're going too fast in a maintenance area, slow down, and, and it can communicate that information as well. So uh, to answer your question, yeah, there's some differences in, in what a live driver in the attenuator truck would be able to tell you, but uh, there's technology there that can compensate for that. I was just wondering, I can imagine there's probably something in place to deal with a failure of the GPS system, say it loses a signal or something? If it loses the signal, uh, it will stop. It, it'll, go into, it'll go into lockdown mode and then you'd have to uh, reset it, determine what caused your loss of signal. Uh, that's something that never happened during our testing. It, uh, it was the GPS aspect of it was uh, was reliable. We didn't have any trouble with that. I had a question. Um, when I talked to Royal Truck about um, putting the system on another truck besides theirs, they got really nervous and started talking about costs and engineering costs and all the. Um, so they say they can retrofit, but are they really? They're not really prepared to do that right I, now. I don't know how long it will take them to. Uh, Incorporate, you know, they I don't. They have certain trucks right now. Theirs, of course, and I believe, I believe Freightliner is the other one that they have a, a kit for. And yes, they uh, they tell you that it might cost a little more, but I think if uh, they want to have this be a a nationwide technology, they're going to have to figure out a way to make it fit other chassis and platforms other than this one truck. So have you guys done um, testing with any hackers or anything like that, trying to see if they can, you know, because it's wirelessly connected, right? To see if somebody can like get into it, make it fall off a cliff or anything like that? We have not done that yet. I know it's been discussed, uh, the, uh, the risks of that and how do we secure that so it can't be taken over by some third party. Um, again, that wasn't part of this testing, but it is a consideration going forward. Keep in mind it was developed for the military, so they probably have done that, but we don't know. So have, have you tested it in, obviously it's still in one piece, have you had, is it going to shut down and 
when it's in an accident or is it going to leave the scene of the crime? <laughs> we, we haven't actually had it in, a, in an accident-like scenario. We did, uh, we placed uh, barrels, uh, timber, uh, we, you know, to replicate something or someone going in front of the vehicle. Uh, but we didn't actually try hitting it from behind or hitting it from the side to see what would happen there. So you, ha you, you don't know what it's going to do when it gets hit from behind? Yeah, the assumption is it's going to it's going to stop because it's supposed to lock up the brakes. Okay. And uh, and it, you know the attenuator, the Scorpion will do what it does on any other truck. It'll it'll absorb and deflect. But uh, no, we didn't actually try to have uh, an accident with it. So. <laughs> the preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.